Let me ask you to please take your listening guide that hopefully you found inserted in the proclaimer you received or picked up. Or if not, we encourage you to get one. You can take some notes on that and share those with uh, some, some folks later. Because this morning we want to, con- we want to conclude uh, this message series called The Call of Christmas where it focused on the four times where the angels came to announce the birth of Jesus. We began several weeks ago when the angel Gabriel came to Zacharias to announce the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. And then when Gabriel went to Mary and announced that she was going to have a child. And then when an an angel went to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and said he should marry Mary because uh, that conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. And then today we come to Luke chapter 2 where the angel and then a multitude of the heavenly host go to the shepherds who are out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. We find this story in Luke chapter 2, so I encourage you to use your Bible or, or the pew Bible that you have there in front of you or your phone or tablet, and, and then keep your Bible open or keep it turned on so we can follow along these verses and see what the Scriptures have to teach us. Because I hope you didn't come to hear what John Waters had to say. I hope you come to see what the Scriptures have to teach us about this wonderful event called Christmas. Chapter 2 begins with that famous story that uh, a decree went out and everyone had to be taxed and then... Joseph and Mary went down to Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of, Mary, of, of David. And verse 6 says, While they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And then in verse 8, the, the, the scene shifts out to the fields. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen as it was told them. This was a life-changing moment when Jesus was born and the angel announced it to the shepherds. Uh, I was wondering in preparing for uh, this passage, what were some of the other life-changing, world-changing events that have been witnessed by humankind? And I did a little Google search, and you'll be surprised. It's quite interesting when people begin to list what are the world-changing events that we've seen, uh, the things that have shaped the world in which we live today. If you're a, a teacher or a college professor, that might be a great assignment. Tell your students to choose 10 world events that have shaped the world and have them write an essay on that. And all you students can thank me later when you get that assignment. Uh, some of the events that commonly appear on such lists, they say that the rise and fall of the Roman Empire has changed the world in which we live today. Even in Bullock County, Georgia, some of the things we do, the measures we have, the language we use, was it reaches all the way back to the influence of the Roman Empire. Interesting. Another thing that changed our world was the Protestant Reformation of the 15 and 1600s. You remember the story of Martin Luther and, and, and nailing those theses on the church uh, there in Wittenberg, Germany. Even today, this church most likely may not exist had it not been from the ripple effect of the Protestant Reformation. The Renaissance period in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, the the re-engagement with learning and literature and science has indeed affected our world. The Gutenberg printing press invented there in Mainz, Germany, 
There's a museum in Mainz, Germany for the Gutenberg printing press and what a difference it made uh, in the 15 to 1600s. I believe it was 1685 when the first edition of fake news came out. <laughs> also, uh, on this side of the country, the American Revolution. That certainly changed this world in which we live when we colonialists said, oh, King, what's his name? We're tired of you. We want to have our own nation or something like that. <laughs> in 1917 was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and Lenin and communism, and indeed, uh, the Bolsheviks and the communists, and that certainly shaped the world in which we live today. World War II certainly changed this century, indeed changed the entire world, and almost every list you pull about world-changing events, it has the September 11th terrorism that indeed has shaped the way we live our life today, hasn't it? World-changing events. And this list, or any list you would comprise, You'd have to say none of these events, none of these events has changed the world as much as the coming of Jesus Christ has changed it. Because the coming of Jesus at Bethlehem that we celebrate at Christmas, the coming of Jesus not only changed this world, but it also changes eternity. It changes not only this life, but it also changes the next life. It was first announced to the shepherds here in Luke chapter 2. They said, Behold, I bring you, and notice in verse 10, good tidings of great joy. That's as good as it can get. That's like a chocolate on top of vanilla ice cream. Good tidings, great joy. This is a good, world-changing, life-changing event that a Savior is born for you today. Now, why is it so important, this announcement of Jesus? Why is this such a life-changing event? It's because who Jesus is and the difference that Jesus can make. Here's the main thing to know when we consider the coming of Jesus at Christmas time. The main thing to know is Christmas, meaning the birth and coming of Jesus, Christmas changes either everything or nothing. The message and story and the truth of Jesus Christ, that changes either everything in your life or it changes nothing. There can be no in-between. There can be no halfway. Either Jesus changes you from the top to the bottom, from the inside to the out, or he might as well not change you at all. It changes everything or nothing. The shepherds were never the same once they had come and once they had seen the, the, the baby Jesus lying in a manger. Do, do you think they quit telling people about it? Do you think they ever forgot the night the angel appeared to them? Do you ever think they they quit telling people about the Christ who is wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger? It changed everything about them. And it can change everything about you if you believe and trust the story of Jesus. Let me tell you some of the good tidings of great joy that are in these verses here. I hope you still have your Bible open. The, The reason why Christmas is such good news, why it's Uh, uh, good tidings of great joy. The first reason is because Christmas is good news for everyone. This is so important and changes everything because the story of Christmas is for everyone. That's what the angels are, are saying here. The angel speaks and says, I bring you good tidings, in verse 10, of great joy, which will be for all people, all people of every nation, tribe, tongue, and culture. That's the reason at the end of the Bible, when it describes the end of time in Revelation, gathered around the throne of the Lord Jesus are people from every tribe and tongue and nation and culture because Jesus came for all people, which includes me, praise the Lord, and which includes you. The the message of Jesus is for all people. Ever wonder why God chose the angels? I mean, ever chose the shepherds? why, Why did he choose the shepherds? Why not some business people? Why not some family, some other? Why not some children? Why not some religious? Why, why the shepherds? It's because the shepherds represented all people. The, the shepherds could be classified as, as, um, as uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, shepherd, the shepherds could be as the unexpected people of the day. <coughs> unexpected. Of all the people that would hear the message of Jesus, you wouldn't expect it to be the, the shepherds. Now, the problem we have here in uh, this, the Western world in modern times is we have romanticized the shepherds. 
We had this image of a beautifully dressed shepherd with a nice shepherd's uh, staff and there's some rolling green hills and clouds in the sky and a blue sky and a gentle breeze blowing across the field. And there's four or five white sheep dotting the landscape. And it's a beautiful, bucolic, very peaceful uh, image in our minds. Well, get that image out of your mind. <laughs> That's not the shepherds here. This was a dirty, thankless, lowly job. If you, no mama ever wished her boy would grow up to be a shepherd in the first century. This was a dirty, thankless, low-class job that, that you certainly didn't want to have, but it represented the common people, those who were overlooked, those who were forsaken, those who were forgotten. And the glory of God's grace is that no one is overlooked, no one is forsaken, and no one is forgotten. So he chose the shepherds as the unexpected people. But not only were they unexpected, but they're also undeserving. They were outcasts. They couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't keep all the feasts. They couldn't keep all the religious rituals. They were social outcasts and spiritual outcasts. They did not deserve this special message of grace of the coming of Jesus Christ. And the other thought is the shepherds certainly in the first century were unimportant. They, they weren't the rich, influential, wealthy people of the day. The shepherds had no power. They had no influence. They, they, they had no caucus to, to bargain for their political agenda. They were just the overlooked, unimportant people of the day. People walked by them as outcasts, the lowly, forgotten shepherds. In today's world, when uh, a, a new member of the royal family in Great Britain is, is born, the tradition for centuries has been to post the birth announcement on an uh, announcement that bears the image of the royal family. It's put on, put on a golden, gilded easel put in front of the royal palace there in London. And it's a royal announcement. It's been done that way for centuries. But in today's world, they, they, even still, they, they use Facebook as well to announce the birth, just like you do. But this tradition is still there, making a royal announcement in front of the palace. But if London was to follow the example of the first century... When a new king of England was to be born, they would send a message during the middle of the night quietly out to the streets and the sewers of underground London, gather the homeless and street people, and say to them, guess what? We've not told anybody else, but a new king has been born, and we wanted you overlooked street people to know about it first because he's been born for you. That's what happens here. The king of all kings and the lord of all lords was born, but he went to the shepherds, the outcast. The undeserving, unimportant people of the day because if, if it's not good news for the lowly shepherds, if it's not good news for those who are overlooked and outcast and downtrodden, if it's not good, for good news for the forsaken and forgotten people, the undeserving, unexpected, unimportant people, then it's not good news for me. And neither is it good news for you. But the great truth of Jesus is it's good news of great joy for all people. Another reason this is important in verse 12 and 13 and following is because it's good news about Jesus. Verse 11, the angel is very specific. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, and it is Christ the Lord. Now, when we, we use the term Jesus Christ, we think it's his first name and his last name. Jesus Christ, like I'm John Waters. But that's not the way it is. The word Christ was a title. Just as I'm John the pastor, he was Jesus the Christ. And what the angels tell him, the shepherds, notice they don't use the name Jesus because that wouldn't mean anything to these shepherds. The angel told Joseph to name him Jesus. The angel told Mary to name him Jesus. But notice when the angel speaks to the shepherds, he doesn't say anything about the name Jesus. He says, born to you today is the Christ, the one the prophets foretold, the one you've been looking for, the one you've been waiting for, the Savior, the Christ is born. So the good tidings of great joy were about the Christ Jesus. It's not that God was sending another angel. God wasn't going to send another prophet. God wasn't going to do another miracle thing in nature. He was going to send the Christ, the Savior. And Christmas is good news and changes your life because it's all about Jesus Christ. That's why they cry out in verse 14, glory to God in the highest. Because God has 
glorious doing something. He's coming to earth. God himself, not an angel, not a prophet, not a messenger. God himself is going to clothe himself in human form and come and be born as a baby. The almighty creator, sovereign God of the universe is going to be born as a baby, totally dependent upon Joseph and Mary to nurture him along. And, and th that, that miracle of miracles is what people call the incarnation. The word carnal meaning flesh. God came incarnal, in flesh. And the incarnation where the Almighty God clothed himself and became in human form, that is the miracle that's happening at the birth of Jesus. Not just that he was born of a virgin, but that God himself had come to be with us. The miracle of Jesus' birth is described in John chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, incarnated. It became flesh, and he dwelt among us. The Almighty God walked on the face of this earth in human flesh. That's the miracle of Jesus' birth, that he was fully God. When he was born in Bethlehem's manger, that was Almighty God from the tip of his head to the bottom of his toes. Almighty God. He may have only been eight pounds and four ounces, but he was the Almighty Creator God of heaven and earth. Fully God, but yet in Jesus, we also know he's fully man. 100% God, not 50 and 50, 100% God and 100% man. I know that's bad math, but it's good theology. I know it equals 200%, but really it's one person. And the, one of the foundational doctrines of historic biblical Christian faith is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. If you, if you meet any person, any group, that denies the fullness of godness and the fullness of madness in Jesus, that person has fallen beyond biblical Christianity. This is a non-negotiable item of our faith, that Jesus in one person, in one nature, is fully God and fully man. And that's so important because as a man walking the face of this earth, he was able to die on the cross and shed his blood. But because he was God... He was qualified to take your sins away. I could die for you. I could shed my blood for you, but I'm not qualified. But Jesus, the God-man, is not only willing to die, but he's qualified since he's both God and man. That's the wonder of it. That's the miracle of it, that God in his love and grace would come to earth. And he himself, he himself, not an angel, not a prophet, not a preacher, God himself would pay the price for our sins. In his wonderful book entitled Knowing God, J.I. Packer makes the profound statement that the incarnation is not simply a marvel of nature, but rather a wonder of grace. That the Almighty God, it's, it's a miracle, but, but, but the greatest thing is, is not that it's a marvel of nature. It's the wonder of grace. God saw us in our sin. He saw us in our lostness, in our rebellion, in our evil, in our wickedness. He saw our hopelessness. He saw our helplessness. God knew that we were under his wrath and under his condemnation. God knew that because of our sin, which every one of us was born with, we were facing eternal punishment, eternal death, and eternal damnation. But God, who is rich in mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, clothed himself 
in human form, came born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. He was despised and he was rejected. He was mocked and he was ridiculed. They arrested him and they beat him. They scourged him. They pushed a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed his feet and his hands to the cross. They suspended him between heaven and earth, life and death for six hours on the cross of Calvary. And he died for my sins, not his sins. He died for my guilt, not his guilt. He was paying for my transgressions, not his transgressions. So when God clothed himself in human form to live on this earth as a substitute for you and for me, that's not just a marvel of nature. That is a wonder of his amazing, matchless, marvelous grace. That's what the birth of Jesus teaches us, the grace that God would come himself and die on the cross for our sins. That's the reason Jesus either changes everything or he changes nothing. A third thing we learn from these stories, I hope you still have, you still have your Bible open. A third thing we learn is Christmas is good news to share. You can't keep this to yourself. We, we need to tell people the wonderful message of the Lord Jesus. Notice in verse 15. When the angels finally went back to heaven, the shepherd said, let's now go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's come to pass. And verse 16, they came with haste. This was so important. They weren't going to dilly-dally. You know what that means to dilly-dally? They didn't want to dilly-dally. They, they made haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, verse 17, they made widely known the saying that was told them. And all who heard it. Apparently, they kept on telling people. All who heard it were amazed. And verse 20 says, the shepherds returned and they glorified. They were praising and glorifying God, telling everybody about what they had seen and what they had heard. The shepherds, had, they came and saw, and then they went and told. They had a story to tell. They wanted people to know that God had provided a Savior and that life and forgiveness and peace were now possible. Well, guess what? The same story the shepherds got to tell is the same story that we get to tell. The same story we get to shout from the mountaintops, to tell in our homes, to speak to our friends in our personal web of relationships. The story of Jesus that peace is possible, grace is available, and heaven is attainable if you'll trust and believe in the person of Jesus who died on the cross to pay the price for your sins. We have a story to tell. In one sense, we need to tell the story across the globe. There are more than one billion people on the face of the earth this morning who have never once heard the gospel story of Jesus. And there are places across northern Africa into Central Asia that a child could be born this morning and live 60, 70, 80 years. And unless something changes, that child will die 80 years from now and never once, never once, ever hear the gospel story of Jesus. So this story needs to be told across the globe. I have the great joy of being a trustee of our International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a, a board uh, that has about 80 trustees. I'm one of the, uh, uh, the ones from Georgia. They come, we come from all over the United States and we, we have our meetings usually in Virginia and we set up the qualifications for missionaries, we do some interviews and parameters, and we give the final vote to send a missionary to a certain part of the world to dangerous places and unreached people. And, and time after time, I meet these missionaries who are going. So, so many of them are young adults. They've just finished college or just finished their master's degree, and they're going at age 25 or 29, age 30. Uh, I was having dinner at one of our meetings with one of our missionaries. We were approving to go. And I, I said, tell me about your ministry. And and there he was sitting next to his wife, and they had a baby, you know, an arm baby still, baby. And they had a one-and-a-half-year-old and a, a three-year-old and a four-year-old. He said, we're going to Kosovo to work with Muslims just north of Albania. Another young, a single young lady, the age of my daughter, we green-lighted and approved her. We sent her to the Horn of Africa, which is East Somalia, just south of Yemen. A young single woman, about 29 years of age working in that part of the world. We're sending these young adults to dangerous places and faraway places, places you wouldn't send your children to, and places where if you had a, a connecting flight, you wouldn't even want to get off the plane. But a steady stream of these young families where young children were sending. 
And every one of them, every one of them is ready and excited and willing to go. And it's a humbling experience to see how they want to go across the globe. So let me encourage you to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. Every dime and dollar you give to this offering goes to send and support the personnel that I as a trustee and we as Baptists have sent to dangerous and difficult places. This, none, none of this stays in the bureaucratic machinery or denominational uh, of, of, of bureaucracy. Every dime and dollar goes out across the globe. So give generously because you're giving for real people in real places sharing the real gospel. This story needs to go across the globe, but it also needs to go across the street. You know, people in Bullock County are just as lost as those in Botswana. People in Stilson are just as lost as people in Sarajevo. People in your neighborhood are just as lost as those in the faraway, difficult places of the world. So we need to take this amazing story of Jesus and take it across the globe and across the street. We have a story to tell. Let's spread the story. This week I was reading in the newspaper and, and a big announcement uh, with the big soccer stadium being built by Register Road, uh, the Tormento. you got to support the, support the local soccer team, amen? Uh, thank you, all six of you. <laughs> They're going to have a tough season if that anymore. Any more supporters than that? Uh, but there's it's supposed to be a big grocery store. Uh-huh, I got your attention now, don't I? A big grocery store right next to the big soccer stadium. And the rumor, they neither can confirm nor deny that it might be a Publix. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now we're, now we're going to have revival here in a minute. Amen. <laughs> And people, but we don't know, we don't know, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know anything you don't know, but, but we're, everybody's talking about it. Yeah, I, I just hope we'd get as excited telling people about Jesus as we do about possibly about a new grocery store coming to town. Because what's going to change people's lives? What's going to save people's marriages? What's going to heal people's families? What's going to save their soul is not the rumor of a grocery store that might be coming, but the profound fact that Jesus Christ has come. He was born in Bethlehem's manger. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitute death on the cross. He was buried by the morning of the third day. God raised him from the dead, breaking the chains of death, sin, and the grave. And so let us proclaim like the angels did about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us share the story near and far, at home and abroad, across the street and across the globe, because the hope that people are looking for, the life they've been longing for, the peace and grace they've been searching for can be found in the person of Jesus Christ. So let us proclaim it loudly. Let us proclaim it boldly. Let us proclaim it courageously that born to you this day in the city of David is a Savior and it is Jesus Christ who is the Lord. That's the story we need to take across the globe and across the street. My friend Wayne Bray is the pastor of First Baptist Church in Simpsonville, South Carolina not far from where my mom and dad grew up in Pelzer in Piedmont, South Carolina. He recently posted the, this great thought that the only hope for a world that's turned upside down is a church that's turned inside out. I think my friends got it right. The only hope for a world that's upside down is for the church, the people of God, to be turned inside out. Is the world turned upside down? You, you bet it is. What's right is now wrong. What's wrong is now right. The things are upside down. Things are going crazy. But the only hope for Statesboro, the only hope for this nation, the only hope for this lost world, the only hope for people that live in a world upside down is for the church, the body of Christ, to be turned inside out. During 2019, I will uh, complete my... Uh, 13th, uh, 14th year as your uh, pastor, start my 15th year. That means I'm halfway, about halfway through a 30-year ministry with you wonderful, loving folks here in Bullock County. I don't think uh, any pastors had the privilege to stay 30 years, but, but uh, I'm, I'm about halfway through that. But I'm at a point in my life, my age and my tenure, 
I'm at a point in my life that I want to be turned inside out for a world that's turned upside down. The question is, do you want to be a church? Do you want to be a church that's turned inside out because the world is upside down? The story of Jesus compels us and calls us to do nothing less. The last thing I'll mention this morning when we talk about the story of Jesus, Christmas, is that it is good news also for you and for me. It's good news for me. It's good news for you. The very last verses talk about the shepherds returning, glorifying and praising God. They went back to their workplaces. They went back to their families. But they were never the same again. The final question is, what do you need most this Christmas? If you were to fill in the blank, what I need most this Christmas is, and, and you get to fill in that blank yourself. Well, what would you put in that blank about what you need most this Christmas? What's going on in your life? What's going on in your family? You might think you need the latest PlayStation, but that's probably not what you need the most. <laughs> You might want a new car, but that's probably not what you need the most. Maybe this Christmas there's some sin from your past that's got you locked in a prison of regret and shame. And what you need most is to be set free from the shame and the regret of some sin in your past. Maybe there's some broken relationships in your family. Maybe there's a son or daughter that's not invited to your house this Christmas because something that was said last Christmas and what you need the most is healing in your family or your marriage. Or maybe you've got some big decision coming down the pike, some big decision about work or finances, something in your life, and, and what you need is some clarity. What's the right thing to do? You need God to help you know this is how he's leading you or directing you. What do you need most this Christmas? I bet you it's got nothing to do with what you can buy online or in any store. <laughs> but the great truth of the coming of Jesus Christ is whatever you need most at Christmas, you can find in Jesus. Because the angel said they're bringing good tidings of great joy. And whatever you need, you can find it in the person and in the works and the grace of found in Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus doesn't change everything, and if Jesus doesn't touch everything, then he's probably not changing anything, is he? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that whatever we need in this life, we would look for it in the terms of Jesus. In our family, in the peace we long for, in the decisions we make, in whatever season of life we find ourselves in, may we put Jesus right in the center of it. And I pray on this Sunday before Christmas, you would draw us to that point in these final moments even now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing our final song, and I'm going to be standing at the front other ministers are going to be standing down here as well because we want to give you a chance to respond to what God has been teaching you today as we work through these scriptures. Is there some way you need to reclaim the wonderful message of Jesus that in Him, in Him, you can find grace and peace, salvation, the certainty of eternal life? When we sing this final song, you might want to walk forward to one of us and that we'll be at the front and pray with us about what God's teaching you, some, some question you have, some commitment you're making. It might be a commitment of, of changing something in your life. It might be a commitment to be baptized like Sydney was baptized at the start of the service. It might be a commitment to something in your family. But whether you walk forward or right where you stand and sing, what is God asking you to do? What has He been teaching you this morning? And during this final song, May you be faithful to do whatever God has called you to do. Let's stand together. Let's sing. As God leads you today, come. Oh.